<laughs> yes. <laughs> Good. How are you? Good. Uh, so just before we get started, just let you know that we do record our consultations. Um, it's on the form and everything, but we like to just give you like another heads up uh, before we start the actual consultation. So just that. Um, but go ahead. I read a bit of your form yesterday. I forget your dogs, and I know it's a Shiba, correct? A Shiba, is it a Shiba mix? He's a total mix. So he's a rescue. So we know his mom was a Shiba. They were both um, left at a shelter. And the other half of him, we have no idea. But he definitely has some Shiba traits. Got it. said okay. people, but it's unconfirmed. I see. Okay. Um, but yeah, just go ahead and just fill me in uh, with any important information you think I should know about. Um, as you speak, <laughs> I'll take notes as you go along. And then after that, we will go from there. Okay. Sounds good. Notes or... That's okay. Um, let's see. So we got Ben in October. We were told that he was about a year old. Um, so he's probably a year and a half is our best guess. Um, and he had never been on a walk before and he had never been like in an apartment with stairs <laughs> or in a city with sidewalks. He lived in the country at a foster house with a bunch of other dogs. Um, so it took him a while, uh, but he's really acclimated. He's a super duper friendly dog. Mm -hmm. He loves to play and loves other dogs. So we make sure he goes to doggy daycare once or twice a week. Okay. Um, we have not been able to get him to really respond to any commands. Uh, he, you can, we can call his name and it's a toss up whether or not he decides to respond. Um, he, it, he likes everything to be a game. So when it's time to like leave the house. Well, I'll have my leash in the hand and he's been bothering me to leave. Like he's been scratching at the door. He will then run around the house. Huh. So it takes a very long time until he'll allow you to approach him and put a leash on him. So currently I just stand by the door and stare at the door until he uh, obeys. Because if I just run after him, it becomes a longer game. Yeah. Um Okay. But, uh, and he also wants to play with every dog on every walk. So he will go into a deep bow and, and just lay down on the sidewalk uh, <laughs> until they come to him, mm -hmm. which is very silly. It's cute, but it's not helpful. Of course. Okay. Um, anything else that you know about Ben? It's it's tough to take him to the vet or get him to take medicine. He's very he really doesn't like to have his paws or mouth touched at all. Um, and like once he ate pills, and I was trying to get him to induce vomiting, and he just I could not get near his mouth with like the hydrogen peroxide. Um, he would he's he's he's, he's fine. He's, he's fine afterwards, but he's just. And then, like the vet, he like expressed his anal glands at the vet. He really freaked out when they were like looking at his paw the other day. Um, so he just usually likes being pet, but highly protective of his paws and, and his mouth. Got it. And then, how does that look? Is he just is he more like uh, like squirmy, or is he being defensive and being mouthy, or how does no how he'll flippity flop like a fish is the best way I can put it. Like he's just very hard to like if he does not want to be handled or touched, like he will wiggle beyond belief. And he's very strong. He's like you can like see his muscle definition. It's a little silly. Um, um, okay. For, for like bathing him, we figured out if if we can hold him by the harness in the shower so his feet are not touching the ground. That's really the only way we can like wash him. And even there, he'll like kick wildly so he'll like scratch me unintentionally but uh but that was the only way we could like get him get him yeah off. i mean it's the concern is that he's going to hurt himself or hurt other people in an, and it's not he just he's just trying to get yeah, away he doesn't bite or anything intentionally no. so. mm -mm. nope and he won't even 
nibble and he's great with the cats and the cats are pretty terrorizing to him but you know he'll the most he'll do is just to kind of stand and gently bark at them and just stare at them got it cool. I'll follow them around sometimes yeah. but he is a a, a very not, gentle not yeah yeah Cool. They'll kind of have standoffs in the hallway about who can get past. Um, yeah. But they, they, the cats will swat him, but that's about as, as much physical uh, as they get. Okay. Um, cool. So, so far, you know, it sounds like, you know, you're wanting a recall, um, help with the, a little bit, a little help with the walking on the, on the leash outside. Um, and kind of, you know, <clears throat> having more of a, you know, when we're in a moment of seriousness and, you know, we're trying to be serious here, it's not always going to be a game like with the leash and stuff like that, right? Um, so more control, more discipline, just like when you're getting ready and stuff like that. And then um, with the paws and the bat bathing and all that stuff, um, like on the, on like, uh, you know, list of priorities, where would you like rank that, you know, because it sounds like recall, I mean, recalls obviously, the most important command. that's number one yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. um so as with the pause you know um we can work on that um is that like a top priority for you guys or how, how do you guys do that no i mean i think uh what we ended up doing was giving him a bit of a sedative when he had to get his uh nails trimmed oh, okay um so that worked okay. um and the groomer was really great as far as okay. Okay. She like held him from above and made him feel like totally surrounded. So that worked and it wasn't feeling the sedative was helpful. Right. Um, but I feel like we've got some workarounds for that and that doesn't happen every day. Um, perfect. Okay, perfect. It's good to hear. It's good that he's got, you know, a groomer that would, you know, follow through and everything like that. Because sometimes groomers just like, nope, can't do it. And they just turn away the dog, which makes sense. You know, if you're unable to, uh, if you don't have that experience, it's probably unsafe to just see what has to see what's going to happen, right? So that's that's good. You guys have a groomer there. Um, anything else I should know about Ben or any other goals you have with Ben? He does um, like we turn if we turn our back, he will destroy anything. So he will like hop up on the dining room table and take all the plates down and run with all the forks in his mouth, like. He's, you know, like we, like if we take groceries in the house, like we have to be really careful because he'll just go and steal them and just run away, like grab shampoo and just run and make a huge mess. And it's kind of yeah. into everything. Um, does he, does he, worse when he's, sorry, I was just going to say it's it get worse when he's anxious too. Like when, when, you know, my wife goes out of town, he really will get into stuff more than, than usual. I see. You guys try the kennel with him, the crate? Yeah, we were told he was crate trained when we got him. Um, what we later learned is that they just kind of put him in a garage in a crate in a crate at night. And this is in Michigan, it's kind of cold. Um, and I think he just cried the whole night. And so when we tried here, um, we were just not successful because he will just he howled and he'll howl. howl, he'll just he does like I mean, the Sheba scream is real. Uh, um, so he just does like the Mariah Carey, like higher than high. Um, and we have neighbors. So um, we worked a little bit to try to, you know, just associate the crate with treats, but we have not. Got it's it. not like a, he's not substantially trained to do it yet. No, nope, he is not at all trained to do that. Um, it would, we're, we're open to it. Um, I don't know if we've waited to. Nice, nice to have the Yeah. Experience. Got it. Um, has he ever been left home alone before? And how does he do? He does fine when he's home alone. Um, he mainly just like looks out the window waiting for us or sleeps. It's, um, you know, if, if it's like when I'm out of the house and you're trying to like get a work call done in the back of the house and you've got both cats with you, he will like try to get in the room and just doesn't He's anxious because I guess yeah, he'll come up we're to me not and, there. Like, yeah, do that kind of yeah, like the Sheba scream at me um, when Mama's gone. 
and you know just want one constant like kind of attention and reassurance uh, uh, okay if, if, have you ever if, yeah like if we... hello yeah we're here oh, um what were you saying sorry it, it, it was cutting in and out oh i i was just saying um he he really wants attention and reassurance, like when uh, when Mary Claire is out of the house. If I'm if I'm the only one here, and it, usually the cats want to be with me too. If I'm the only one around, so and that that will kind of instigate conflict between them. Okay, got it. Um, have you ever, when you were crate training him and everything, um, did you ever put him in the crate when you guys were home with him? Or was he only in the crate when you left? We only had him in the crate while we were here. Okay. Um, and I even like slept next to the crate okay. one night. Um, and, and that you... went okay because oh. I was in the room. Uh -huh. Um, but and he, you know, he he is food motivated, but he has a hard time taking a treat from anybody's hand. Like you kind of have to throw it. Um. So that's you know, we throw like mozzarella stick pieces in the crate uh, to try to you know get him to associate it. And he's gone in there voluntarily like once or twice just on his own, but it's not. It's still if you put him in there, it's in our living room, um, and it's just like one wall away from our bedroom where we would be sleeping like at night. So I think he can like hear us and all that too. I don't know yeah okay yeah it sounds like you know most dogs have that same issue where it's you know it's it's when they go in the crate it's not issues that that staying in their part where like dogs would struggle um does he try breaking out or is he just vocal oh he'll definitely like gently try to break out like he'll like I rub see. his nose again i mean he's not that physical I see. Scrap. like if you try to keep him out of somewhere he wants to go he'll kind of to scrabble his paws against the door. Okay. Okay. He might give up eventually, but it's, it takes a while. Got it. Anything else? He doesn't, you know, if we're, <laughs> he's a little weird with new people. He'll bark at them a lot. Um, Outside or inside? Uh, inside. Sometimes yeah. outside, but may if the person has a dog, great. If the person does not have a dog, um, oh, there you go. <laughs> so, but if, uh, like, the weird thing is, like, I'll go out in the evenings and it's dark, and there's, you know, sometimes random people standing in front of buildings on a phone, just like doing nothing but talking. And he does not like that. If someone is like walking and going to their car or walking a dog, fine. But if just a person is just standing there, he's very bothered by that. So okay, how does he? Um, is that the only uh, scenario where he will bark at a person outside? Um, sometimes if someone like I don't really let people come up and pet him because I don't I don't know how he'll truly react. Especially he's very cute, so children want to pet him. And if he doesn't seem really into it, I say no. So he's maybe been pet like twice, um, but he'll seem a little like nervous, like, like his tail isn't wagging, it's a little down. So I'm like, nope, we're not doing that. Um, so I haven't really let that whole scenario play out. Okay, so it seems like when people are confronting him, he's uneasy, but if people are just walking next to him and you know, not, you know, uh, he, yeah. he um, <laughs> And then in the home, um, how does that look when people come over? He'll just bark a lot at them and kind of follow them around. And um, he'll get you, like, like our, our friend Terry came for the other, the weekend, uh, two weeks ago, and she stayed with us. And so he barked at her for the first, like, five minutes she was here. And then he kind of, like, got cool and was, like, okay with being pet and all that sort of stuff. And then she left to go do something for an hour and came back in the room and he was just like, never seen her before. And that happened like throughout that weekend. So I don't know what that's about. And sometimes even like 
well, Twyla wears makeup. Um, and sometimes when Twyla just goes and does hair and makeup and come out, he's like, bark, 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 bark. I see. Um, um, if, if you have guests come over and let's say they sit down on the couch and, but, or not, but Ben, Ben has settled. Has you, have you ever seen him bark when, you know, the person gets up, claps, laughs, or anything else that might trigger him to bark in those moments? Or yeah. just, okay, okay. So it sounds like from everything we're gathering, um, you know, with, with dog personalities and stuff like that, you know, we have a nervous dog, anxious dog, fearful, aggressive, confident, all these different like terms and like uh, labels for dogs, right? Um, but we never always have like, it's never just a nervous dog, right? We look at everything, right? Envi environmentally, Ben could be very confident, right? But with people, he could be nervous and nervous. the nervousness could be very low, right? And then the anxiety can be a little higher than the nervousness, right? So it sounds like he has a little bit of nervousness. Um, how I know that is when someone leaves and comes back in, he's thrown off. He's not expecting that, right? So that's a very... Uh, um, that's just a sign of a nervous dog, right? Other, other dogs who are, are more nervous, um, if you're walking down the street and someone says, oh, cute dog, they will trigger and they will bark. Um, if, you know, someone comes in the home, they're able to settle. But the moment someone laughs, um, gets up or does something that's just all of a sudden, it will trigger them again because a nervous dog um, doesn't like changes, sudden changes. Right, so the picture is we're all here, we're all together. Person leaves. Okay, that was kind of weird. Oh, the picture's changing again. The person's coming back in. Then they trigger. Right? Um, does that make sense? Yeah, that makes total sense. Yeah. And you have the anxiety as well. Um, anxiety looks like it starts to kick in when he gets stressed. So that is a stress response. He gets anxious, and then you see like the pacing, the vocalization, and all that stuff. Right. Um, um so that's more like behavior it's like behavioral stuff i'm noticing um you know shebas are more of a uh, primal dog breed right they're they're very yep. far from like the original dog like a normal dog right um we have worked with shebas in the past we're aware of how vocal they can be right um so it's nothing new to us but so far you know when it comes to obedience and stuff like that <clears throat> Um, sometimes you can get like a protesty Shiba. And I'll, I think the recent Shiba we had, it was Nolan. He was like 11 years old, right? So they were, having, yeah, they were having a baby and stuff like that. So we're just layering some obedience. He did great. The Shiba before him did great. We had an Akita recently. He did great. And then there was one Shiba who was very vocal. Like the moment least tension would get on the neck, boom, start screaming, right? So we had to work the dog through that and everything like that, kind of teaching them that, hey, something to freak out about. Uh, we also had a Husky who was uh, uh, kind of same situation, never had a leash on his neck, never walked, and was uh, more of like a feral dog, right? So they started training, and um, I'm pretty sure, you, are you guys aware we do e-collar training, correct? Yes. Mm -hmm. um, so, so that dog, we couldn't jump straight to e-collar. Right, because that's a, a very unique form of pressure, right? So we had to do a lot more basic stuff so that we can build to that, right? Again, all dogs are different, um, but this dog specifically uh, needed more more uh, foundation before we jumped to that sort of tool there for him. Um, but um, having and how to make progress with the separation anxiety. Even if you don't, you know, uh, for, you know, if you don't decide to train with us, something I do recommend is um, try your best to do the crate training stuff when you're home and you can keep the kennel next to you. It doesn't matter where the kennel is at. You can start easy for him. Then slowly keep the kennel moving. And the goal will be that you guys are home with the kennel in another room. OK, it is really difficult, as you saw, as you can see, for dogs to be in the kennel while you're home. That's more difficult than when you leave. OK, because they're wondering, yeah. you're home. Why am I in the kennel? Right. So we tell all we told all of our uh, COVID clients, you know, how does a regular job look for you? Oh, we're going to the office, you know, seven hours a day. 
well, practice crate training your dog for that amount of time so that when we do go back to uh, your normal stuff, it's uh, very flowing and it should be easy transition there. Does that make sense? Cool. Um, Sorry, he got found a box of Girl Scout cookies. So. Oh, um, the crate, you know, I've had owners tell me, um, you know, they were trying to crate train their dog and then uh, same thing, uh, neighbors upstairs, downstairs, left and right, everywhere, right? Um, so they just, they tried a uh, play pen, like a little gated area for their dog and their dog did great, right? Usually yeah, we... But we, unfortunately, we can't even do like gates that are less than six feet because he just he can leap like a horse. Like yes. he we couldn't even we tried to like do a gate at the end of the hall and just like a yeah. regular baby gate, like three feet high or something. It took him like two seconds and he was like, oh, I got this. Yeah. Um, um, but, you know, the client did that. It worked for them. And, you know, as far as, you know, what we want to kind of um uh, work on we would we would have rather as a trainer we want to work on the problem right a uh, play pen would have been a band-aid uh getting rid of the crate is more of like you're not addressing the problem you're just fine like you know, it's a different solution right but the owner was happy because the doll was better in the play pen than the crate same thing here um ben is not destructive or vocal when he's free roaming and you know when you guys are, are not at home he's great he's not destroying anything or being vocal it's more of like he gets destructive when he gets stressed or anxious right because the frustration and the anxiety has to go somewhere right anxiety an anxious dog always wants to move right so i don't know if you've ever seen those videos where like um um you know, they're, they're usually called like a uh, soldier or owner goes to the army for so and so years and comes back to their dog, right? They come back yeah. to the dog and the first thing usually the dogs do is they go grab a toy and they come back and they're just like squeezing it and they're just getting all wiggly, right? That dog is releasing its excitement and excited energy on the toy, right? Because he's probably knowing like, I can't jump on this person, but I'm so excited it has to come out. Right. Same for humans, we have those um, stress balls, right? They help us kind mm -hmm. of like, relax. The same thing there, where it's 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 nothing, um, you know, nothing personal. It's just it happens because they're just like I need to let it out somehow, right? Um, the goal would be when you're anxious, when you're you know um, all stressed out, that there are other healthier ways to kind of uh, deal with that, right? Same thing for our children. If we're upset, you know, it's, it can sometimes be inappropriate to just burst out and start crying and, you know, going crazy, right? You need, you need uh, healthy habits and how to handle when you're sad or upset or anything like that. Or, you know, we're not, you know, letting children put holes in the wall or anything like that, right? There are other ways to let us know that you're upset or angry. Same thing with the dogs. Um, does that make sense so far? Yeah, that makes sense. Cool. Um, so... As far as when we're walking him and everything, um, what's uh, what's the, the 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 tool you have on him when you're taking him out for walks? So it's a harness, gentle leader, collar, prong collar, slip leash. Um, so he has a harness and a what is that thing called? Martindale collar. Okay. And then you're using the harness for walks or the martingale. Uh, we have, we were told because they're, oh. she was our escape artist to use both. So we have the splitter. Got it. Okay. Um, so as far as for walking, the only issue you have is he just lays in front of dogs, correct? For dogs? Well, he gets overexcited. So if he sees another dog, he wants to like run across the street to them, but somehow that manifests for him by just like laying down and being like super play pose to be like play with me okay. and so everything kind of stops like I can't unless I like pick him up like he's gonna be there okay. um so that's not the end of the world he will he does he's you know this way and that way and you know he's not as bad but he will wrap that leash around you if yeah. given the opportunity I see so, so mild to moderate polar on the leash to like 
he will sometimes want to get ahead. He he basically just wants to react to like everything when we're out walking him. Like he wants to react to other dogs and you know check out every tree and. Um, yeah, he's the dog that will pee on twenty things while you're out and about. Like he's and we live in an area. We're in Hyde Park where a million dogs live on our street. For the most part, they're friendly. Um, but uh, but yeah, there's a lot of sense everywhere. Got it. Okay. So um, it sounds like he's just overstimulated on your walks. Um, too many options. He doesn't know what to do. So he's just kind of going all over the place, right? Um, yeah. And sometimes, you know, we if there is someone, there's like a makeshift dog park in the playground by our house. And if people are there, we will go and play and run with him. And so that happens on some walks and that happens on not on some walks so there's a little guy he likes to play with in the morning and then there's like there's like a 10 30 night crew on the weekends that goes um and it's great he gets a lot of energy out because this guy can run really fast um but it's not all it's not there's not oh it's not always possible you know to go there and we and we almost always walk by it so that i think he's pulling because he wants to go there right don't you think Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. Cool. Generally, you know, on the days when we can get him a lot of exercise, when we can either take him to the dog park or it, when he's at doggy daycare, you know, he's generally pretty well behaved after that. If mm -hmm. if we've tired him out already, yeah. I see. Okay. Um. So yeah, on the walks, it sounds like, and I'll I kind of I'll speak about later how important, even though like there's not you know, it seems like minor things on the walk. I'll explain why it does kind of take over. It's like it's, it's bigger than what it seems, right? So right now he's just it seems like he's just overstimulated, doesn't know what to do, and he's just like all this, all these um options for me. What do I do? Where do I go? What's over here? There's a dog there. It's, he's kind of just he's in he's he's he just uh, he's very uh he just keep he keeps going right. He doesn't know how to stop right. Uh, so physically he's getting exercise, but mentally he's just going. He's nothing's really um, tiring him out mentally, right? So. When it comes to walking dogs and stuff like that, harness is the tool that we tend to try to avoid. Um, harnesses, even though it's you know around the whole dog's body, it, it makes you think you have most control because you're controlling the whole, like the body, the main, the main you know chest area, right? Um, however, for communication purposes and everything, um, it can promote pulling and give you less control because you're controlling the strongest, also the strongest part of the dog, the chest area, right? So when he goes to that laying down and you're pulling him, he's not going to move, right? He's going to stay there because uh, dogs also have what's called opposition reflex. Are you guys familiar with that term? No, I'm not. Are you? So basically when you, you apply pressure in a certain direction, he wants to go opposite, right? So if he wants to go to the park and you turn around and you pull, he's going to want to go even more intensely that direction, right? Uh, if he's laying down and trying to pull him away, you're going to start to see him lean against, away from the pressure, right? That's just like a natural response some dogs have. Some dogs, uh, their opposition reflex is a lot more stronger than other dogs. Some dogs have a lighter way to, to uh, when they're communicating that way, right? However, harnesses prom, um, activate that very easily, right? So harnesses are used for huskies to pull sleds, right? We need them to pull. Um, harnesses are also used for our protection training dogs. So when we have the guy across with the bite suit and I have my dog in a harness, I'm, I'm uh, amping him up and I let him pull me a little bit, but then I pull back and then he gets frustrated when that happens. So I'm creating the aggression. And once I see the appropriate amount of aggression, I let go and he goes and bites the guy. Right. Um, so first for communication purposes, we will want to communicate to him, you know, hey, uh, we don't want you to pull. We don't want you to do this. We want you to do something else. Right. And sometimes clients, will, you know, it's the same thing with the flat collars. Right. Even if the dog has a flat collar, they're still going to pull. So the reason why they use harnesses is to obviously avoid the trachea damage here because uh, the dog's pulling on you have the collar on the neck. It's just going to mess up and they're going to be coughing and choking the whole walk. Right. So I understand. Um, there are other tools out there like slip leashes, prong collars, um, gentle leaders, um, all great tools. You can still, you still get a decent amount of control with them. Uh, so like gentle leaders, we use them for our puppies again, to avoid any trachea collapse, um, uh, 
damage here. Um, are you guys familiar with prong collars? Not really. Mm -mm. Um, do you know what they look like? I don't think so. Prong collars are those those spiky ones. They look like spikes. Oh, uh, okay. Gotcha. Uh, so prong collar is another great tool. We don't, just so you know, we don't offer programs with prong call, and I'll explain later why. Uh, but prong collar is a great tool. Um, some clients love it. Some clients notice that when they use prong collar, the dog still doesn't care, and they override the prong collar, right? It um, usually happens with our, our bully breeds and our, like, glabs and those tough working dogs because they're just like, I don't care what's the the things on my neck. I want the bird. I want the duck or whatever it is, right? Um, you can still teach heel, stay, sit down, come place the prong collar and have a good recall, but you're never going to get to the point where you can have your dog off leash because the only way to connect with your dog if the dog doesn't respond is to use the prong collar, which means you would have to have a leash on, right? Um, sometimes, sometimes with Sheba's, uh, prong collar could be too much pressure. Right. So then now the, um, if, you know, um, comparing it to e-collar, right. You can't control the amount of pressure communicated to a dog if they decide to, if they decide to lunge. Right. Um, and I guess I'll talk about it later as well, but e-collar, you can control how much pressure and how many levels and all these more, there's more, uh, it's more nuanced, it's more specific to the dog versus prong collar. Um, you know, there's only one kind of level technically, right. Um, it's a very nuanced tool. You need to learn how to apply pressure using your hand and leash communication. So it's a lot of skill to use prong collar. And sometimes owners get very, um, not overwhelmed, but very like, you know, it's, it can be frustrating, right? Cause you guys are dog owners, right? We're dog trainers and right? we don't want to, you know, teach you to that certain level of being a dog trainer. We want to teach you guys dog owners, right? So sometimes prong collar can be a little, little complicated for some dog owners, um but again great tool um uh, it's just it has a very low ceiling rate of success right it's pretty low uh but you can still get a, a some some sort of progress right um which then brings me to um uh, are we gonna say something sorry uh so like with the martindale collar is that what it's called martindale oh, that was the connector no, no that's the so when we it's like a choke collar right? yeah it's kind of like a choke collar yeah. and i think it's mainly because of the way his head and his neck are shaped he can slip a collar like nothing yeah so um, the martingale so i think does that do anything <laughs> the martingale is basically just like a regular collar right because when it closes it's not closing all the way versus like a slip leash This is a very basic one here, but um, so the dog's head is here. If he were to pull or pull out or try back away, this thing is going to close and it's going to keep closing, right? I think martingales don't close all the way. It just closes a certain amount sometimes, I think. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, usually for the martingales, it kind of just closes and doesn't stop. Like it stops, right? There's like a stopper, I think. Um, so there's nothing wrong with martingales. They're they're it's a good collar. Um, uh, you know, as long as you know he's safe, he's not going to slip out of anything. Um, usually, yeah, I think that was the main point of that because uh, we were like we could not adopt this dog without getting that specific collar, this specific harness. Like they were very, very specific. Um, but you know, we we can do our own thing. It's our dog. <laughs> Uh, but no, that's good. They're offering you, you know, safety backups and stuff. That's good. Um, so those are the tools. Um, prong collar. The reason why it could be effective, kind of left this part out, is because of the way it's shaped. It's supposed to mimic um, a dog mouth or dog bite, right? The way it's shaped, right? A good prong collar um, has three plates, there's a plate in the middle and then two plates in the side and all the prongs are going against each other. Okay. So when you apply pressure, it's all equal around the neck. Okay. Um, dogs are physical animals, right? So if Ben is at the park and there's a dog that is really bothering him, not leaving him alone, all these things, um, and he tries to run away because maybe that's his first response. Leave the situation. But this dog keeps pursuing him. Ben 
might correct him. Do you guys know what a correction is? Like just like a not a not a heavy duty bite, but like a like a lighter bite. Is that yes? Um, that's normal behavior. That's how dogs communicate because Ben can't tell the other dog off or leave it or sit. Uh, dogs don't give each other drugs. Dogs don't neuter or spay each other. Dogs also don't put each other in timeouts. It's if you're going to do this behavior, you're going to get this consequence. That's how dogs communicate. Okay. So prong caller, when they were creating that tool, was to try to use dog psychology on dogs, right? And they didn't know is oh, physicality, right? Because that's what it is on the neck. It's physical. Okay. Physicality is working on our dogs, right? They understand that pressure and it's quick. Because it's their language. That's how they that's how they communicate, right? Um, so that's where it kind of comes from, which then brings me to e-collar, because e-collar technically is still a physical tool. Um, how familiar are you guys with the tool um, electronic collars? So I mean, I've seen people at the dog park with it, and then um, we were recommended to you guys from um, from our friends Terry and David. They have a Saint Bernard. Um, and went through the training with you guys, gosh, two years ago, probably. Um, For the dog. And that were uh, pilot. Pilot. Might have been Jesse's clients, I think. Yeah, it was, I think, yeah, it was Jesse. Um, and they said that it was just like so helpful because, I mean, that dog is massive. Um, yeah. And uh, also, I've, you know, I've noticed as far as this, our dog goes, um, with vibration and things like that, he's very responsive to all sorts of sound. Like if I use my electric toothbrush, wherever he is, he will come running. Okay. And he wants to see that. He wants to, there's a frequency that he's hearing. There's something yeah. going on that he responds to. Yeah. So that when I heard about, you know, e-collars and the ability to do, you know, not just shock, but vibration, right? And is yeah. there, some of them have a sound component? Yeah, so um, the brand we use is called Dog Truck. Um, there are other brands out there uh, that Jesse has used in his past, but Dog Truck has gotten him the uh, best results and it's been really consistent. Um, some other brands, um, you know, um, are, you know, the, the way the stimulation is delivered is different between different brands, right? Um, Dog Truck does have the pager, which is also known as a vibrate. Um, option for that remote and stuff. However, we don't use the pager. Um, pager doesn't have a level, right? It is just one consistent feeling. So for some reason, it's too strong and Ben is freaking out and panicking. Now, there's we're not even, we're, we, we can't teach anything if he's, if he's panicking the whole time, right? Versus e-collar. It can be lower, a lower, softer touch than the vibrate. So that's why we favor the, the, the stimulation part more than the vibrate. Mm -hmm. Or maybe Ben doesn't care about the vibrate. He's just like, whatever. Well, now we can't. Sure. I don't know. Yeah. Exactly. Right. Um, so um, we do use pages like deaf dogs, right? Um, that helps them and for like recall and stuff like that. Right. Um, but yeah, uh, Dodge is the brand we use. Um, it is a. How do you spell that? D O G T R A dog. Oh, okay. Um, it is electric, yes, but it's not electricity. So it's not like flowing to the dog's body when we're using it. It's literally just a muscle contraction type tool. So sometimes, you know, we had a, a therapist uh, compare it to a miniature TENS unit, if you guys are familiar yep. with that. It's a, I am. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so it just contracts the muscle. So whatever those two contact points on the collar, whatever they're touching is what it'll be contracting, right? Um, the brand Dogtra, on the Dogtra brand, it has 127 levels of stimulation, okay? In increments of one. So one, two, three, four, five, all the way to 127, okay? You, if you've done research or if you looked at other options for e-collars, you might've seen eight levels, right? Don't think we have a hundred more levels than their level eight e-collar, their maximum level eight and our maximum 127 are equal, okay? They just-, just more have, variation. Exactly. We have we can be way more specific to the dog's personality, the breed, scenario, right? Because uh, as you can imagine, if you only have eight levels, those are pretty big jumps, 
right? Yeah. So if a five is too much for Ben, but then four is too low, now we're stuck, right? Um, versus dog shrug, 20 is too high, 10 is too low, 15, 16, right? We can be very specific to the dog's personality and then stuff like that. Um, waterproof, a mile to a half mile long range, rechargeable, you don't need batteries. Battery loss lasts a very long time uh, when you're using it. Um, but also about the e-collar technology stuff. Um, very simple to use, very easy. You might see other brands, they have like, a, they have eight levels, but then they have three main levels of low, medium, high, and then eight in each category. And you have to change it on the remote every single time if you're, you know, like for emergencies, right? It's too much. Versus Joshua, just a dial, just a button. And then that's it's very simple, very easy to use, right? Any questions about the tool itself before I begin talking about uh, introducing it to Ben? Um, so obviously they have a whole range of products on their website. Um, <laughs> is there a particular one that you guys like or something like that? What do you recommend? Yeah, so um, how much does he weigh? He weighs 25 pounds now. Oh, he's a little guy. Yeah, he's not not a big guy. So when it comes to Shiba's, I have to think about, because there's the 1900S Black Edition, there's the 1900S Regular Edition, and then there's also the 2300, and then there's the 280C, okay? The 2300 is a good option if you don't care about aesthetic right it's more of like a uh -oh. <laughs> it's, it's 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 a box more box shaped collar right okay. the 1900s black edition is not a box it's more of like a longer it kind of curves curls around the neck so it's not bulky now you're gonna notice that there's a price difference, right? The black edition is more towards like the 300 range and the 2300 NCP is more, I think 230, 250, I can't, I can't really remember. Um, you don't want the 1900 S regular edition, okay? When we used that system on anxious dogs or even a Shiba, it makes them more vocal and more agitated because the stimulation hey. for that system is uh, a little sharper. It's more like needling, right? Versus the Dogtra 2300 and the Black Edition has more dull, a duller feeling to it, right? So the dogs respond better, okay? Because sometimes clients will see, you know, the 1900 Black Edition and the regular 1900S and wonder, well, why would I get the most expensive one if they're both saying 1900S, right? Well, that's why, because sometimes dogs do not do well with the 1900S regular edition, okay? So it's either going to be the Black Edition or the 2300 NCP. And also, sorry, just a heads up, uh, my assistant Tina will send you all the, all the links and the information as a follow-up. Oh, okay. Um, but those are gonna be my two, um, two preferences there, the Black Edition or the 2300 NCP, okay? Any questions about that? Cool. Um, so that's the technology. Um, what else? Okay, cool. Uh, so when we're introducing this tool to Ben, um, the first thing we teach is, you know, how to understand where the pressure comes from, when is it going to come, how it goes away, and just kind of learning, um, just like the feeling of stuff like that, right? Because a common, um thought process people have about e training is dog does bad behavior and then you blast them, right? That's not how it works. Um, you know, if it was done like that, there would be a lot of confusion, right? Because now the dog's wondering where did it come from? When is it going to come back? You know, what's going on, right? So before we dive into like the behavior stuff like that, uh, we need to introduce it first with something that he is familiar with, which is walking, okay? Um, our version of heel, which is our walking command, is walk with me, stay with me, sit when I stop, okay? So if I take five steps, he takes five steps. If I take 10, Ben takes 10. And when I come to a stop, he's to automatically sit 
with the shoulder parallel to my leg. Okay, loose leash in any environment. I don't care, uh, you know, how many dogs are around. That's how strict the heel needs to be. Okay, so again, we're teaching this exercise first. Uh, obvious reason would be for the obedience, right? Having more control, getting rid of that zigzag on the walk, right? One spot, one location, easy walk. Um, the other reason why this is important to teach is to have them understand how the pressure works, right? Having him learn, okay, if I do this behavior, the ECOG turns on. If I do this, it turns off, we're good, okay? So he's learning that he is the one in control of the e-collar, right? Because Ben will never know you guys are the one pressing the button, okay? Because sometimes owners think, you know, is my dog going to hate me because I'm electrocuting them, right? Doesn't happen because there's nothing physically connected to you and the feeling on the dog's neck. Does that make sense? Okay, uh, so again, obedience, having him learn the pressure, where it's coming from, how it goes away. And then lastly, would be um, to help him, to help his overstimulation, okay? Um, dogs tend to wonder, dogs tend to need a job and they are fulfilled with a job, right? So when we're telling him finally what to do on the walk and to not be too overwhelmed and kind of, you know, uh, sniff this, mark here, lay down here, right? Once we give him a, a, a job, it almost like calms him down because now he re he's realizing, oh, when I come out to this big, huge world, right, this is what I need to do, not figure out what I need to do for myself, right? Because uh, then he just, he stays stuck, right? So once we give him a job, sometimes it can help address a lot of things indirectly. So one time I had a client um, their dog used to stare at shadows and glares and they would just stare at them forever until it went away and they would drool. They would just stay stuck. Right. So I never, I never had to address that. Oh my behavior. gosh, that's crazy. Yes. I never had to address that behavior directly. Heard of that. <laughs> because by class three, right. I asked, Oh, how is that shadow thing going? Cause we're going to, I was going to get ready to do it in home with them. And they're like, Oh, it went away on its own, okay? Because when you start to introduce structure, rules, and boundaries, right, to the walks, which dogs tend to do three times a day, which is a big part of their day, um, it's re it relaxes the brain, okay? Uh, so I heard some dogs are much more calmer in the home because now not only are they getting physical exercise on their walks, but they're also getting the mental exercise because it is mentally tiring, to keep the shoulder parallel to your leg for the whole walk or some of the walk, right? So it's tiring for the dog. So then they're more fulfilled when they get home. They're more tired. They're just more relaxed. Um, what else? The, okay, that is one thing that we forgot. So I think it's a puppy thing we've been told, but uh, we have to like cover up uh, certain reflective surfaces mm -hmm. and close all the lines at night because he will see his reflection and think it's another dog and lose his mind mm. um so we've actually nicknamed that dog in the mirror jen's oh, okay. we say it's cousin jen's we have a silly joke about it um it doesn't happen as much as it used to it used to happen every night and now it happens maybe once a week i see so that's part yeah. of he generally gets sort of hyper vigilant at night, so he will mm -hmm. wait by the hallway door in case anyone is walking through it, and he will like patrol the house sometimes. Um, I see. Yeah, yeah, that may be anxiety left over from the day. Yeah, he gets about four walks a day, uh, about 20 30 minutes each one. Mm -hmm. Um, with hopefully almost all days gets a run in as well at the at a, with other dogs. Yeah, um, <clears throat> um, so that stuff's good. Um, keep it that way. You know, it's, it's good to get a healthy routine and everything. Um, um, as far as for like the, I don't know, some of clients call them, uh, like uh, they have a nickname. When the dog kind of like gets like zoomies at night or just more intense at night, they, they call it something, right? Um, 
we'll see how that works out once we start to introduce the style of walking and then the e collar and stuff like that because again something might resolve on its own some things might not and it's kind of like they're just communicating to me like okay enrique after this week at night he is way more calmer but um you know when mom leaves the house or the room he still kind of gets amped up and then we'll talk about that stuff separately as well um once we teach heel we can go ahead and dive into you know the recall stuff and um you know guests coming in so that we're kind of helping him or we have some sort of way to communicate to him to like hey buddy so and so is coming over you don't need to you know panic or anything about that um any questions so far about that stuff so where uh where would trainings take place yeah um are you guys thinking about in person perfect cool yeah i think so yeah okay um so for the in-person trainings um well depending on the weather because right now i do in home we do in-home training um we do at the facility training and then we also do at oz park um it might be if you're in hyde park it's probably a little farther from you guys or how far are we from you do you know the distance because we're in like near the west loop oh we're not i mean we have to go like we have to leave our neighborhood for everything so we can come to oz park it's fine it. <laughs> or to um, your facility either of those is fine it's you know 20 30 okay. minutes Perfect. yeah okay um so um yeah depending on the weather when it starts to get good uh we have all our sessions at oz park okay um if for some reason you know we're training at oz park and we have a few classes and there's one particular class it's raining uh we do meet at our facility so we still have like another option in case weather doesn't uh, um accommodate for us um for the in-person program we have uh six nine and 12 and the three week program but from everything i'm hearing um minimum i would say uh six class bare bones because it'll be two classes heal two classes recall and in home for your guest and then that six class could be saved um or we can go ahead and just teach you like another obedience command if we have time or if that's something you're interested in so think of a six-week program more for clients who are like i just want my dog to walk nice in a leash i let him run around i do recall and i go home okay the nine-week program are for clients who want more um more so like uh if they want to take their dogs to like a patio and then have the dog lay down and not move for like an hour or two right it's more stationary control more proofing with the commands and everything like that right so that's like the nine week program the nine week program also offers you more wig room just in general right so it's be two classes heal two classes to recall and in home so that's already five classes uh and then six seven eight and nine one could be a stationary control type command in the home and then one could be like at the patio uh, so the, uh, what I mean by that stationary control in the home is more of like, a, are you guys familiar with the command called place? Yeah, I mean, did you guys watch that episode? Of, I think we watched a show called It's Me or the Dog, and she was doing place. Like yes. you're like, the okay. dog stays, yeah. the stays on the mat or whatever. And Yes. Yeah. Um, so um, place is a very useful command in the home um, when it's reliable and very uh, consistent, right? Uh, so we can kind of do more with Ben obedience wise, right? Um, the 12 week is for clients who want everything, right? They go hiking every other weekend. They need a dog completely to be off leash trained, um, proofing of all commands, heel stay, sit down, come place. Uh, so it's, it's a lot more, um, more lessons, more time, more proofing, more commands, all these things, right? Um, but again, minimum bare bones. If you're just trying to address, the, you know, the walking, the recall, and then some of the anxiety in the home and the nervousness, six weeks. A 90 week is, would be uh, better because it's going to give you more wiggle room. And then if you're interested in like, you know, more stationary control, that's a good program as well. 12 week is, you know, if you want, again, like everything there. Uh, so um, between those three programs, they all work for you. It's just depending on like, you know, what works for you, right? It's an hour once a week. 
Um, we give you one topic at a time, you practice, we come back next class, how to go, teach you a new topic, right? And it's also all verbal instruction, right? So with the trainer, the trainer does not touch the dog, right? It's all verbal communication because at the end of the day, we know what we're doing. It's going to be you guys who are going to be walking Ben, you know, at home and doing all these things, right? So it's important for you guys to get the hands on and having that, uh, you know, training tied to you from the start, right? Um, any questions about the in-person program? I mean, I think in-person is preferable. Yeah, it's easier to, you know, I guess, observe and tune how the dog is doing. Yeah, yeah. Um, do you guys want me to talk about the other programs or are you guys pretty solid or set on the in-person? Six to nine sessions. Six to nine sessions, absolutely. We can That's do that. Good. And then you can also um you can also add some. So maybe you do the six week program and you're like, wow, this is great. I want to learn more. You can buy a three week program and then have more class and then we can go over some stuff if you're interested. Okay. Um any questions about that? Cool. Um some common questions I get about e collar stuff is is the e-collar on all day? Is it on during night? Do you know as does a does a dog graduate from it? Do I still need it in the future? How does that work? Okay. Um, the e-collar is on when you need it. Okay. So if it's just um, you know, the family home for the night, you're not expecting one coming over, he's chill, we're all good, then you don't need the e-collar. At night he's sleeping, you don't need the e-collar. Um, on your walks, the e-collar should be on. Okay even after you complete your program, okay? Um, this is because we cannot predict what's gonna happen on each walk we go on, right? So for example, my dog, she is four years old. I've had her on, I've started e cloud training her when she was five months, six months-ish, right? So uh, by now, at this point, maybe like, I press the button like two times a month, right? It's on her because she still has not experienced a car backfiring next to her. She still ha has not experienced a firework going off when it's not the 4th of July, right? She has still not experienced some things, but I know that if she were to get flighty or scared or spooked or um, maybe um, I accidentally throw a ball into the street, I know I have control immediately and I can able, I'm able to kind of calm her down or get her under control. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, so it's not so much of the, you constantly still needing to use it. It's more of like you have it on when you need it. And it's more like a, if, you know, for emergencies only. Okay. Um, does that make sense? It sounds great. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the other question I get is, um oh how come when i take the e-collar off my dog goes back to pulling like why does that happen right um uh, we call it uh but this is um it's more of like a nature thing it's called opportunistic behavior um humans do it as well so like the example i like to use for like my clients is you know do you drive on the highway they'll say yes i'll say do you go to the speed limit and they'll say no and i'm like well what happens when you see a cop or a squad car and like Oh, we slow down. I was like, yes, because when authority is there or, you know, the ones who can make things happen is there, you want to like, obey, right? Uh, same thing with dogs. Some dogs are more opportunistic than others. So I've had clients come to me and tell me, hey, we didn't have the e collar on during this walk and the dog did great. We don't like it. The dog's just great. Okay, perfect. That's fine. Um, I had other clients tell me the moment the e collar is not on, boom, right to pulling. It has nothing to do with the tool or you guys, or the trainers, or anything like that, that is just nature, right? If dogs know they can get away with something, they're gonna get away with it, okay? Um, sounds like Ben might be more opportunistic than most dogs, from what I'm hearing and everything. Um, so it's nothing out of the ordinary. I'm just giving you a heads up that, that what you see there, or what you might see is normal. Again, all dogs are different. I'm not saying he's gonna be for sure a dog who's gonna you know, know when the e is on or off, um, but just a heads up for that stuff there. Um, any other questions? Cool. Um, uh, I guess because there's three of us, so would you want all three of us for all of the trainings, or 
if only one of us could come does that work like uh no all of you guys can um can attend the training and we'll work with everyone as well i had a, i think i had a client who brought like her three kids her brother her boyfriend and it was like a, a bunch of people at os park so um i'm used to like, <laughs> just having the families and all that stuff and the children there so um uh, the three of you wouldn't uh, shouldn't be an issue or anything like that um, but if one of us couldn't join the session is that okay that'll be fine all the sessions okay. all the sessions are recorded Okay, so for some reason, one of you guys don't make it, I can just, you know, you have the video, you can, you can watch it, kind of catch up, and then we're all good together. Um, any other questions? But we, we each would have to, like, practice with the dog separately for the dog to, like, understand or recognize the commands. Um, yeah, so... Uh, yeah, so however life looks, right? Um, obviously, you have the, you know, there's... You know, most famous have like the primary walker, secondary, and then, you know, the other one, right? Um, whatever life looks like is how you guys can practice, right? So, um, but yes, everyone would have to, you know, do their rounds technically. Um, but whenever I work with multiple people or like couples, for example, right? Partner number one goes first. Um, they're doing the hard work because they're going first. They hand the dog off to partner number two. <laughs> Once they hand the dog off to partner number two, right? Sometimes I'll hear, oh, the dog's so bad with me. It's going to go really bad. I'm like, okay. And then they go and it's easier than the first time because if partner number one is using, sorry, one second. Can I have perspective? Yes, that sounds good. Sounds good. We'll see you soon. Thank you. Thank you, man. Sorry, the client. Very late. Or... Okay. Um, let's say, for example, partner number one is working with Ben, and their number on the system is 15. Okay. When partner number one has been off to partner number two and Ben is still feeling 15, 15 still feels the same, right? So there's no, he's stronger than her or she's stricter than him. It's 15 feels 15 to anyone who's handling Ben. As long as everyone's practicing the same exercises and everything, it's going to be the same thing, right? So that's like another wonderful thing about e-college training is that it's um, very easy to transfer commands and behaviors over to a new person because the feeling is still the same. Does that make sense? Cool. Um, any other questions? When Okay, so when he would go to the dog park or go to the doggy daycare, would he have the e-collar on there? If would he you... needed it. If you need it. So like okay. if, let's say, you know, I had, you know, um, um, I do prefer to have it on because one time, a client told me that they were at the dog park and there was a dog fight going on and their dog was curious. And they're like, what's going on over there? Right. Uh, so it's, it's more like, again, like a backup emergency, but if your dog actively doesn't have any uh, bad behaviors like mounting or wheelchair squatting, then it's more like a personal preference for you. Uh, as far as doggy daycare goes, that depends on the daycare. Some daycares don't use e-collars and they're not, they're not really familiar with the tool. So they'll just tell you, you can bring it, but we're not going to use it. So I probably wouldn't just bring it to, depending on the daycare, right? Um, any other questions? No, I think like we would definitely use it at the dog park because it's very hard to get Ben to leave. Uh, but he yeah. just doesn't, because he won't eat. It's also a command thing. So he doesn't, he's just going to be like, I'm just going to run around and you know, everyone else can leave, but I'm staying and it's. Oh yeah. That that's, um, those are, that would be a good example and good a scenario to have the e collar on so that you're not just circling around chasing Ben, but that makes sense. Um, any other questions? You know, he's really great with other dogs. Like we, um, you know, he's beloved at the doggy daycare, both of, both of them, um, the, the weekend one and the weekday one that we've tried out. So, 
um, Hyde Park is who we typically go to, and they have been great. Um, yeah, I heard good things about them. He's good. Um, uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Cool. Uh, what's the schedule like? I guess, or how far out are you booking? Or yeah, so you have availability. I am not familiar with the schedule right now. My assistant Tina handles all that stuff. Um, after this consultation, oh. she's going to be reaching out to you guys. She's sending you a follow up email with the e cost I recommended, with the prices, uh, the programs I recommended, with the prices, and then a form that needs to be signed and agreed to. Once the form is filled out and agreed to, we can go ahead and begin the billing and booking process. Uh, we work with your availability, so you'll give us some times and dates, and then we'll kind of work with that right there. Um, but um, she will send you an email with a bunch of stuff and details and like stuff like that, okay? Um, anything else? Cool. We appreciate it. Um, so very nice meeting you guys. Uh, nice getting a little glimpse of Ben um, there. But um, other than that, just keep a lookout for that follow-up email. And then you should be receiving it either tomorrow, Wednesday, or following day, Thursday at the latest. Uh, so just keep an eye out for that. Um, I think I had one client who said their follow-up email went to spam. So just double check just in case you don't see it by Thursday, so check the spam. Um, but other than that, um, yeah, just keep a look after that email and then we will be in touch. If anything does come up in the meantime, feel free to email me any other questions or anything else. Um, feel free to contact me. Okay. Thanks so much. Of course. All right, you guys have a good night.